Good evening and welcome. I'm Monica Bniski, the Curator of Decorative Arts and Design here at the High Museum, and I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. The exhibition we are highlighting is Stephen Burke's Shelter in Place, and it is organized by the High. Major funding for this exhibition is provided by William Banks Junior Trust and Jones Day. Funding for the exhibition is also provided by Roche Beaubois and the Graham Family Foundation for Advanced Studies in Fine Arts. The exhibition is made possible by Premier Exhibition Series sponsors Delta Airlines, Premier Exhibition Series supporters ACT Foundation, Sarah and Jim Kennedy, Louise Sams and Jerome Griot, Harry Norman Realtors, Wish Foundation, Benefactor Exhibition Series supporters Robin and Hilton Howell, Ambassador Exhibition Series supporter, Contributing Exhibition Series supporter, and other generous supporters. I would also like to thank High Museum members who are in attendance tonight. Your support is invaluable and fuels our mission. And of course, if you are not yet a member or need to renew, please visit high.org at the end of this program. And now, before I introduce our esteemed guest for this evening's program, which are Stephen Burks and Glenn Adamson, I just wanted to provide a short overview of the exhibition for those that haven't seen the show or just as a refresher for those that have seen the show. And that is the first slide. So the High's presentation of Stephen Burke's uh, Shelter in Place is the first solo exhibition since his 2011 project at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And this exhibition highlights around 80 objects that were designed between 2007 and 2022. It is a combination of craft-based objects and industrial design projects that were designed by Stephen, in addition to a commissioned series called Shelter in Place, uh, which is also the title of the exhibition. And this is the first time that the series is seen in public. And of course, it was designed and prototyped during the pandemic. The book that I'm showing you on the screen right now um, includes contributions from one Glenn Adamson, who's with us tonight. Um, additionally, Beatrice Galilei, the late Bell Hooks, Patricia Urquiola, and Michelle Wilkinson. And just a small plug, it is available for purchase tonight. I know some of you have bought it. Thank you very much. Um, and um, it's also available after. So Stephen and I, mm, do I know how to work this? Stephen and I began talking about this exhibition um, and specifically ideas surrounding a shelter in place project during the global pandemic. Um, and Stephen had, I thought of between 10 and 12 different ideas that he sketched and collaged. And we narrowed this down to about five concept conceptual prototypes. And the ideas for these conceptual prototypes was that they would demonstrate the potential of radical design during this time of crisis and that these would focus on the domestic interior, right? Because he's an industrial designer. And the exhibition was, was really inspired by, and I'm showing you on the left here, just the cover of the seminal Museum of Modern Art exhibition from 50 years ago that explored um, a series of ideas and not a series of products. And I think it's really important to give designers a space to think about, um, you know, without manufacturers' briefs, to really think about um, what they want to do in the future. Um, and so in doing this project for the high, Burks has offered new meanings about our relationship to consumption, to spirituality, um, and to technology through these shelter-in-place prototypes. And like the Museum of Modern Art show, uh, this exhibition really investigates a kind of similar conceptual framework, and that is how does contemporary design negotiate between the commercial industrial world and the political or social other. And now these shelter-in-place prototypes are interspersed throughout the galleries uh, with several key industrial design projects, like the others that I'm showing you on the right. Um, these were manufactured by Daydon, um, and these are a, a series of colorful hand-woven lanterns. And Stephen, about this project, has said, we all came from somewhere else once. There was a time when we were all the other, so I imagined a colorful community of dreamers. Um, and I was so struck by this because um, you know, Stephen designed this in the wake of uh, the Syrian refugee crisis that was happening in Europe um, in the 2000 teens. Um, 
And so the, the exhibition has projects like this, but it also has projects like the one on the left, which um, are craft-based works. And in fact, this um, series from Masoni was his first foray into this. And for those that have seen the show, you'll know that the exhibition is organized by themes uh, uh, or ways uh, that we're suggesting of understanding his work. So things like weaving as metaphor, the power of experimentation, uh, and craft as collaboration, which for me is really the major thrust of his practice um, and one of the m most exciting things I think that he's doing. So this process of collaboration with weavers in Cebu, the Philippines, um, which is internationally known as a site of weaving, um, and it's really interesting because when you think about factories, right, and Dadon's factory, factories are typically the sites of mass production, but here this is one of a kind of translated hand production um, that offers a kind of customization. And I also think that Stephen's work is really interesting and exciting because it doesn't have a particular look, right? Um, but it is really his kind of signature approach um, of collaboration and this kind of hands-on quality um, that he insists on that makes his work look different from other people. And the last slide before I introduce, um, uh, and this is just another kind of important project um, that we also highlight in the exhibition, and it is the project um, that he worked on at Berea College called Crafting Diversity. Um, and we will talk about this a little bit more during our conversation. But I think it's really illustrative of his overarching commitment to extending craft traditions into the future, um, which is something that's important for him, and really reinforces his practice um, that. Uh, in which he signals a kind of future direction for contemporary design, right? Instead of there being a hero designer, kind of one person at the top of the pyramid, instead he's really um, offering a kind of more collaborative or inclusive approach to, um, to design and to production. And this is a perfect place for me to stop talking about the exhibition and to introduce our speakers for tonight. So Stephen Burks is a designer, an educator, and a traveler. He studied architecture at the at the Illinois Institute of Technology and received his Bachelor of Science in Product Design from IIT's Institute of Design, as well as a Master of Architecture from Columbia's GSAP. Uh, after years spent traveling between Milan and, uh, and New York um, and living in Tokyo, he became an independent designer at the turn of the millennium when famed it Italian manufacturer Capellini first put his works into production. Today, Burks is one of the most recognized American industrial designers of his generation. Through his association with nonprofits like Art Aid to Artisans, Artesanias de Colombia, the Clinton Global Initiative, Design Network Africa, and the Nature Conservatory, Conservancy, excuse me, Burks has wor worked as a product development consultant in close collaboration with hundreds of artisans and craftspeople in tons of countries across the world. Uh, like Colombia, France, Haiti, Kenya, South Africa, the list goes on and on. Burks believes in a pluralistic vision of design that is inclusive of all cultural perspectives. His studio, Stephen Burks Man Made, develops projects that attempt to bridge the gap between authentic majority world production, industrial manufacturing, and contemporary design. He has been commissioned by many of the world's leading design-driven brands to develop collaborations. His work has also been exhibited internationally, including at Art Basel, the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, the Shenzhen Biennale, again, the list goes on and on. And his work is in the collections of the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, the San Francisco Museum of Art, um, sorry, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Victoria and Albert Museum, and now thanks to this show, here at the High Museum. Glenn Adamson is a curator and writer who works at the intersection of craft, design history, and contemporary art. He was previously director of the Museum of Arts and Design, that's MAD in New York City, head of research at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and curator at the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee. He is co-host of Design and Dialogue, an online interview series co-presented with Friedman Benda Gallery and Stephen Burks. Adamson's publications include Thinking Through Craft, The Craft Reader, Postmodernism, Style and Subversion, 1970 to 1990, Art in the Making, and Fewer Better Things, The Hidden Wisdom of Objects. He regularly contributes to Art in America, Crafts, Disenio, Freeze, The Magazine Antiques, and other publications. 
His biographical study of the artist Lenore Tawney is included in the John, Kohler, John Michael Kohler Art Center's exhibition. Um, this exhibition catalog is fantastic. It's called Mirror of the Universe. Um, and his book, Craft and American History, was published by Bloomsbury um, in January of last year. Adamson has also co-curated exhibitions, including Vulcus, The Breakthrough Years at MAD, The Beasley Designs of the Year at the, Muse at the Design Museum London, Things of Beauty Growing, Br British, Studi British Studio Pottery at the Yale Center for British Art, and Crafting America at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, among others. And now please help me in welcoming Glenn and Stephen to the stage. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to start by giving a really loud, raucous round of applause for Monica Minsky. Sorry. Anyway, he knows it. None of this would be possible without Monica's unwavering support and and ambition for the work. I mean, she's taken us places we didn't know were possible. And uh, definitely get the book. Thank you. <laughs> so just to let the audience know what is in store for you this evening, um, we are going to talk for a little bit, um, and then we're gonna take questions, and I'm a very kindly keeper, so I will, I will keep us on task. But also just so you know the kind of running, um, melange of images that are behind us are just here for um, inspiration. They're really not going to be kind of tracked to anything that we're talking about. Yeah, it's like, this is CNN and we're the crawl. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but these images are relevant. Um, you did put them together, so yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're kind of an overview of, of our portfolio, but then they're also a window into our inspiration, um, into our travels. Into the work that made this project. So, speaking of the work that made this project, let's get started with um, this, just the general idea of shelter in place, right? Which is the title of our exhibition. Um, and as many have heard me talk about, um, the kind of uh, foundations for this project were the fact that Stephen and I were zooming weekly at the beginning of the pandemic. I from Chicago because I hadn't yet moved to Atlanta. Stephen from New York because that's where he was is living. Um, and and then and then we kind of came up with this with, with this project. Um, but of course, this idea of shelter in place um, was something that we were living through, and and we felt really strongly, I think, about maintaining the integrity of that phrase, um, despite it maybe not meaning the same thing to everybody. Um, but it meant something to us as we were, as we were you know, starting to bring this exhibition to bear. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, it was, it was a very organic process. Um, and the title for the show, Shelter in Place, speaks not only to the act of sheltering in place and the, the kind of, um, order to uh, stay home during lockdown, but also to how we define place, how we define home, and how we uh, define shelter, and the relationship of uh, AU, <laughs> um, the way we uh, think about um, those two words uh, together, also very important. But we recognize being here in Atlanta that shelter in place maybe has a different meaning or a lack of meaning. Well, so I didn't actually know that until we did um, an exhibition walkthrough for the show. So you had already left to go back to New York. And when exhibitions open here at the High, you know, as curator, you're asked to kind of take the staff through, um, through the exhibition. And it was only at that moment when I started telling people about, oh yeah, this is how we did this, and it was like, oh, well, we didn't actually do that whole thing. Because again, in Chicago and in New York, it, we, you 
were forced to, you couldn't actually go, you couldn't actually go out of the house unless you had, like you had to take your dog out, right? Like that was the, that was the excuse when you were allowed to, to leave. Um, and so I think that turn of phrase maybe meant something different for other people. But Glenn, um, as, a, as a design historian and just general um, man about the world, um, when you heard the, that we were n naming this exhibition Shelter in Place, I'm just curious what you thought of. Yeah, by the way, I was never happier to have a dog, uh, I can assure you. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, well, maybe I'll say two things. One, as, as a design historian, one is that I actually haven't seen any other projects that have really taken the measure of what it was to be locked down. I think in many ways it was just something people wanted to get past and obviously plunge back into reality as, as we used to know it afterwards. And maybe it's almost too close to look at clearly. You know, it's like something held up so close to your face that you can't really see it. And I, I'm really glad that we did this for many, many reasons. But one is that I think in 50 years people will want to look back at our moment and ask themselves, what was that like? What was the creative response? And this exhibition, I think, will be one of the milestones and one of the touchstones when they go to answer that question. But the other thing I might say is that there, of course, is a deeper history, um, an infinitely deep history, one might say, about design as a means of providing shelter. The first thing, of course, you think of is architecture, which has long been in the background of your work, although you're not principally an architect, but obviously coming through Chicago, and the Bauhausian legacy there, the legacy of the new Bauhaus there. Um, has always been a factor in your work, but even if we think about, you know, the first forms of design, they were ways of, that people were giving themselves to shelter out of the rain, out of the snow, their bodies, their families, their hearth, and a lot of that actually is in the show. You know, to me, the way that you use basketry, for example, in this monumental scale, speaks to the very first forms of shelter building, which of course were woven, not necessarily built. Um, but the other th thing that's you know closer um, in, in date that we might want to think about is the legacy of what I would call radical design. This is a little bit geeky and niche, guys, so stay with me. Bear with us. Yeah, but um, around the time that we were all born, you know, in the 60s and 70s, there was this amazing phenomenon that's probably most um, remembered through the 1972 show, I think it was 72, called The New Domestic Landscape which was Italian radical design that was at the Museum of Modern Art. And that was really a set of radical proposals about how we might live differently. Very speculative, very conceptual, kind of politically charged. Italy was going through a kind of tough time. Uh, they actually called it the years of lead uh, because it was so heavy, so gray, so difficult economically. And this was this kind of incredible, vibrant, avant-garde response to that. Um, and really did propose, yeah, the word radical fits, radically different ways of living, radically different ways of sheltering. And I, I feel like in some ways that was a thread that kind of got laid down and didn't get picked up again for a long time. And uh, here I think you're not unique because I think a lot of designers now are starting to ask these questions. I think it's unusual that you're couching it in the context of the pandemic, but I, I guess it might lead to a conversation, maybe a big, good question for you about how seriously you pr propose to radicalize everyday life, whether, whether that's really what the show is about ultimately. Yeah, it's funny. When I reflect on the new domestic landscape, and, and in a sense it's been an important exhibition for me um, and a reference uh, in, in, in a lot of ways, um, I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that it also introduced Italian design uh, to America in a lot of ways, right? And, the, the kind of industrial project of making things for the home um, in these new materials, right? Which, which weren't common to everyday products. Uh, and so I, you know, the word radical, um, I struggle with because it's difficult to, to, to define what exactly is radical. What exactly is radical today? Um, and we propose shelter in place in the context of radical design, but it, it, it feels quite easy and, and approachable for me that people would engage in the transformation of <laughs> their television, for example, or that people might um, consider a new type of partition or, you know, that, that 
design can be a way to unlock the everyday potential um, of all of us who are creative. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I don't know, I, I, I think when we reflect upon it through the lens of the exhibition, the domestic landscape, it seems quite radical, but when we think about the way that design is such a part of our everyday lives today, I think that we're open to a new relationship to the products that we live in. Mm. And for me, that's what the show is introducing. Mm. So as curator and as someone who, you know, when Stephen and I were talking about this exhibition and, you know, proposing the new domestic landscape as a way for us to kind of think about what a radical project might look like, the most important thing for me was thinking about what that looked like 50 years ago, right? What the curator and the museum was questioning, right? And what they were, and what, and, and what that larger project was. And for me, it was super interesting because it was you know, super, you know, the late 60s and early 70s, super turbulent, right? In terms of the politics, in terms of what was happening for environmental rights, for social justice, for everything. I mean, it felt like the world was on fire in a very similar way. Right. If, if the world was on fire, I mean, I, like... I, in that sense, the show is very radical, right? Because in 2020, um, as you guys remember, we were marching yeah. for racial equity. We were, uh, you know, exactly. outside wearing masks. And it just felt like there was so much happening. And, and so um, this kind of social project was exploding and, and playing out on the street. And so in, in, in that way, you know, in a sense, there are things that we're responding to in the exhibition yeah. that, that yeah, are I very mean, much radical. That's so important. Um, however, there's a caveat there, which is you said the world is on fire. And one thing that I really, really am impressed with in the show is the global view. Yeah. So although you just framed it kind of in an American yeah. context, you know, the, the, um, the murder of George Floyd. And, um, and the but Black Lives Matter Black was an Lives international Matter. movement. For sure, for sure. But I, I feel like it's very um, significant that you're working with creative partners that are truly international and coming from lots of different perspectives that may or may not be well known or well understood in America. And so in that way, um, and here I think of your traveler chair also, which is almost like an emblematic object that speaks of this. But I think of really all the objects in your show as emissaries from these other places and other perspectives that are coming here? Well, as a young designer, I mean, I really had to go abroad to get any kind of recognition for my work or to even get work. And I didn't really see that um, as a kind of racial limitation at the time. I mean, the fact that I was the only uh, black designer amongst my peers um, working internationally, traveling to these places, asking these questions. You know, for me, I was just trying to participate. Um, and going abroad was a way to participate and acknowledging that, you know, when I grew up, there was this idea of design coming from Europe. In fact, we had this term Euro styling uh, to define what design was. And not so recently, I think it was two weeks ago, the New York Times cover of the T Magazine said, Good design comes from Italy. So even even today in 2022, <laughs> right? I mean, it's still the case. It's still the case. We're still reflecting on um, a kind of insecurity with what we consider to be good design. And for me, you know, participating not only means um, being present and working for these companies, but also means being present as an African-American, being present in spaces where we have not been present before. And, and opening, you know, leading by example, as my grandfather would say, if, if I could be so honored, right? So I think that that's actually a really great place to pick up another thread, which is the project that you participated um, in with Berea College um, and the Crafting Diversity Initiative because that was another, I mean, I think for your work, right, in which, you, as you just said, the majority of it was spent in Europe, right, and, and working with European brands. And, you know, the ability to kind of come home in a way and to do a project um, with an American college 
um, and to really kind of move the needle and to re to help them reconceptualize what it is that they were doing. Um, I think, you know, at least for me, again, as a curator, I was like super excited by this project um, for its historical threads, but then also I think what it means for your career um, because it does something, I mean, in a way it's similar because you're doing, you're using some of the same skill set that you um, engaged in in other places across the globe, but it's just here. Um, and so I wonder, if, yeah, because yeah. Glenn was also a, a a willing participant in that. Yeah, in fact, that's how we met, in fact. So um, just to give a little bit of history here, because the history is fascinating, um, Berea College was founded in the 1850s. Get this. 1855. 1855, 1855. get this, everyone. It was founded as, as co-educational and interracial before the Civil War in Kentucky. So do the math on that, and it's because it was a religious school, so that's how they were able to get away with that at the time. And they were by a long stretch the most progressive educational institution in the country right up until the end of the 19th century. So we're still talking more than 100 years ago when Jim Crow laws really started to set in in Kentucky and the school was actually forcibly, deseg uh, for rather forcibly segregated and the African American students were compelled to go to a different college and Berea became uh, basically a bastion of what then was imagined as a kind of white Appalachian identity. And it was actually at that point that it began to have a craft program, which was dedicated to, you know, s split oak baskets and broom making and ladder back chairs and coverlet weaving, some of which was sort of made up Appalachian craft, some of it was real Appalachian craft, but it became kind of like white identity politics craft revivalism, if you could put it that way. So then fast forward, way down to the 1980s and 90s, and Berea, of course, starts to integrate again at long last. And then if you fast forward a little bit more, they become actually incredibly international. So not just diverse in terms of their American student population, but their global student population. And then along comes this wonderful guy called Aaron Beale to we love Aaron. the craft program at Berea and turn it from a white identity politics uh, pro project into something that actually reflects the true nature of the campus. So that's when he got in touch with me and asked me to recommend a designer to come in and reconsider the program. And I reached out to Stephen, and that's how we met. And maybe you should take this story on from there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it should be said that Berea College still isn't as integrated today as it was when it was founded. Yeah. I mean, they're still only at about 30, a little over 30%. Um, diverse, quote unquote. Um, but there has never been uh, a person of color in a leadership position related to the craft program. Um, so when <laughs> I got the invitation, um, of course, I looked into Berea, never heard of it before, um, recognizing that it's tuition free really kind of grabbed me. Um, and then understanding that out of 1,600 students, 100 work in the craft uh, workshops. So 100 students working across weaving, uh, broom making, um, woodcraft, and ceramics. Uh, and then having the opportunity to begin a conversation about the strategy of how that program would move or shift from what's essentially a labor uh, position program um, to uh, a kind of creative program. So how do the students um, design what they make? Mm -hmm. And in all these years, since 1855, they had never been involved in the design of what they make. Um, so our first move, uh, and through conversations with Glenn and Aaron, was to create this, this notion of crafting diversity. So how could we use the, the tools of the program to essentially rebuild it? Uh, and rebuild it um, with the students in a position of power. Um, this concept of um, you know, art, artisanal agency uh, we talked about on the tour, um, clearly it's a thread running through my work. And with the students, I mean, having such a large population and such large turnover every semester, it's a great opportunity to introduce um, students who may not ever make another thing in their lives to the beauty of and the joy, I should say, uh, of being creative with their hands and, and, and understanding that you know, hands have power. 
hands have creative power, hands have political power in this case, right, completely changing the craft program. Um, hands have collective power. Together, um, they're stronger than individually, right? And, and the things that we made through the program, um, the three uh, products that we launched, um, the, the pixel blanket and placemats um, and pillowcases through weaving, uh, the community basket mm -hmm. um, through uh, woodcraft and the broom thing uh, through broom making have all um, really been, I guess, sort of signals for what's possible. Uh, and so we aren't telling the students what to design, we're giving them the opportunity to participate in the process of design and thinking about how um, they can have a role either through the customization of um, more standard objects or through the total personalization of an individually designed object within a system of, uh, of craft and uh, craft-based production. And if I could just insert a little bit of etymology, I always like to remind uh, non-German speakers that the word craft comes from the German word for power. So like in, in Germany, a power plant is a Kraftwerk, right? And um, it's just such a great example, like you said, empowering the students. And of course, you're empowering them through craft. So it's just good to, in this context, to remember that craft doesn't have to be this cozy, cuddly thing that reminds us of the Appalachian past. It can be this thing that propels us into the future. Absolutely. I'm just going to, I can't believe I've never asked this question before, but as we, I mean, pixel throw for those that have seen the show, I mean, I understand the kind of customization that occurs there, broom thing also. But for Community Basket, what, how? So, <laughs> okay, I should admit <laughs> that not all of the products yeah. are designed for customization. Yeah. But the surfaces of the bands That's of right. oak um, have the potential to be engraved, um, be painted various colors. You may have seen an image of that. Um, to uh, be drawn upon, right? That the, the surface of the basket itself can become a kind of canvas. Um, but, but really for me, it's about back to the kind of modular approach mm -hmm. of using the aluminum link and the oak bands to, uh, as a kind of kit of parts, yeah. to build a number of objects, the basket just being one of them. The spruce, yeah. which you saw in the last gallery, is another, yeah. right? And so we can go from across the, the range from a useful product like the basket to a more conceptual demonstrative one like the spruce. Yeah. And, and you know what, I always love hearing Stephen get specific because, mm -hmm. and we, we of course love <laughs> yes. this as design curators, but one of the things that every really special designer has is the ability to completely manifest an idea in the detail of the work, the physical detail, selection of materials, right. selection of processes, and that's, you know, that sings from every inch of that show. Yeah. So I'd love for us to kind of transition a little bit and think about future, right? And it doesn't have to be Stephen's future, although Stephen, you might want to talk about your future. But I was just, I've been kind of reflecting recently um, about being able to go out in the world and kind of think about what design's future might be, right? And again, thinking about this exhibition and thinking about the show that we've now referenced a million times for you all, the new domestic landscape at MoMA um, in which the world was on fire and the world is still on fire right now. Um, and this is of course my kind of pessimistic back, background, but um, I you know, will just share that I was recently in the Netherlands and um, was able to see an architectural biennial in Rotterdam in which it wasn't all pessimism. It was actually like, um, you know, there were propositions for the future that held some bit of joy. And, and again, thinking back to our project, Stephen, like that was something that we held kind of at the center of this, right? That it can't be all doom and gloom all the time because humanity needs something to well, look I'm forward an to. I mean, I'm definitely. <laughs> 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 um, I, I always think that design is, uh, I mean, for me, design's the answer. Design's the only thing I know how to do. Um, and design is at the core of mm. our future and all of the mm -hmm. solutions that we have to come up with yeah. collectively. Um, and I was just at a biennial mm. in Venice uh, where um, 
the majority of artists were female for the first time in history. Uh, and it was a very different bio. Mm -hmm. And it was conscious of um, its footprint. Mm -hmm. It was conscious of its materiality. Um, and the stories that were told were um, generative and constructive, not constructive. Mm -hmm. um, very optimistic, just in the sense that birth is optimistic, right? It's impossible to bring a new thing into the world and not be filled with joy about it. Uh, so I think the pendulum swings every 50 years and you know, we're now 50 years <laughs> once again <laughs> since 1972, which is a crazy time, but you know, we're also going through a crazy time and, and design is the answer. Yeah, uh, maybe I could try to yeah, yeah. fill that in a little bit um, because I, I do agree with that. And I think, you know, in a way it's it, it, it kind of, there's no choice but to be optimistic because if you give in to pessimism, then you've given up. And what are you doing to future generations if that's your position? So while I can understand the um, depth of concern, especially around climate change, I think you have to, ha you have to think that, and design would be a great example, you have to think humans will have tools for combating it and changing the situation. And the way that I would frame it, um, obviously we could talk about this for weeks, but just to like boil it down into a simple idea, um, you know, if you think about the woven TV in the show, which to me is kind of the beating heart of the shelter in place project and therefore the show, you know, you have this black affectless product design thing, this kind of slab of electronics that's usually arrives into your space um, and you have so little to do with it, right? You don't know who made it, where it was made. It's soulless. Yeah. Soulless, it's kind of, you know, it gives you no purchase, it's too frictionless, right? Mm -hmm. Crucially, you don't know what the working conditions of the people who made it might have been like, right? So that's kind of what design has been in so many ways. And of course, what you did was to give it this personalized housing, which is very beautiful, personalizable, you know, customizable. And as I was saying earlier, it reaches way, way back into history to primordial craft techniques. So I think that's one answer to think about design giving us ways to reconnect the local to the human, to the analog, to the tactile, um, to the emotional, ultimately. And then, of course, the other thing that's happening, I was talking to Kristen, who's here in the audience about this, who works in, I guess, what I would call the metaverse from a position of ignorance, but, you know, digital interaction um, design. And, you know, that has been getting a lot of bad press recently, especially given that Meta's just laid off all these people. Yeah. Um, and I think just lost $3.8 billion on Whatever that. Whatever that means, yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. Whoops. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, you can see that in the long term, and I don't know how many people frame it this way, but you can see that in the long term, relocating design and investment and intellectual property into the metaverse instead of keeping it in the real world could actually be a very powerful tool to change our relationship with the climate. Because if capitalism is going to exist at all, it needs to have growth. Mm -hmm. You can't have capitalism without growth. How can we have growth without increasing our carbon footprint? We'll put it in the ether. And that's one of the animating ideologies behind the metaverse, of course. And I, I have to this. push back against that, though, because like, <laughs> well, and I, I don't mean, have the skill to judge whether that's viable or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. When my son was nine or so, he came to the studio and he said, Daddy, and I was having a very frustrating day. He's like, Daddy, why are you banging your head against the wall trying to make real things? He's like, you should just make things in the Minecraft world. Why aren't you just designing for Minecraft? At nine. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he was, uh, children are the answer, I'll tell you. So, so have the answer. Um, and, and what could be my only response to that, except to say that I believe that the human condition uh, is based on uh, an outward expression of our dreams. That, that making things is what we do. Um, and, and hiding things in a digital universe may be for a lot of people making things, but I think it's also very important that we continue to have uh, a, a physical expression that brings us together as human beings. Yeah, I would and, just say it's a both and though. Don't yeah, you think? it's not an either or. 
And it's the either or that I think is really scary. We have to resist the politics of the day that are, um, you know, divisional and, and isolating and polarizing um, that force us apart uh, and, and force us to choose, right? Because life isn't about a choice. We're much more complex than that. And I, obviously, right? Uh, this is where you applaud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're much more interesting than that. Yeah. And, and so as we express ourselves um, through objects, I think we create this kind of dialogue yeah. around what's possible. And, and this is where ideas um, are born. So. Speaking of the nuanced approach, um, Stephen, before we take questions from the audience, I wonder whether you might want to tell us th anything that you're thinking about for the real world, not mm. the meta world that um, Glenn's hot, hot tip was, was suggesting, but anything that um, you, you know, is on the horizon for you. Wow, so much. Um, I took the book on tour um, right after the opening of the show. <laughs> um, essentially, uh, three and a half weeks traveling around Europe and meeting with clients and friends and um, seeing things and sharing our work, uh, which was incredibly well received and, and I think perceived as, as very sensitive, um, which, you know, maybe I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, and so, so many projects have, are now coming out of this work. Uh, and so when we think about what an exhibition like this means to an artist, it's not just an opportunity to, to show some things, but it's an opportunity to um, share some things, right? And, and when all of you come to the exhibition and you see what we've made together, you go away and you talk about it. Um, hopefully it's interesting enough that it occupies you for a little bit longer and you share it and, and those ideas spread. And so um, now we're talking about, okay, what happens with the shelter in place uh, prototypes? Mm -hmm. You know, how do these things uh, become real? Do they become real? Is there interest for them to become or do they become NFTs? Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> someone, wants, someone wants to digitize them first. Um, but hey, they could do both, right? They could do both. Um, you know, is, does the private seat uh, become some type of piece of office equipment? You know, does, does the woven TV um, revolutionize how we see television, how we live with television, right? Does it become a little house? for your TV that, that everyone wants to live in. Um, I don't know, you know, does the Spirit House uh, turn into this collection of uh, altars where we not only keep the memory of our loved ones, but we keep the things that are important to us. Mm -hmm. If we're buying less things, fewer, better things, um, where do we keep those? You know, where do we display those? Where do, how do we share those? So there's so many ideas, like the, the project is just, has enriched our practice so much that we, it's impossible to put a finger on a particular one. So, so Monica, I know you're the timekeeper. Yes, I am. But uh, can I ask you one question before? Just one question, and then we're moving on to the well, audience. Uh, so uh, I'm going to put my cards on the table. I, I was so happy when you came down here to the Hive because it's like such a great museum, and Monica's the strongest design curator in he says that to American everyone. museums of her generation. <laughs> so you're very, very lucky to have her here. But um, I think it would be a lost opportunity if I can, didn't ask you the same question you just asked us. So I assume that Stephen's show kind of indicates direction of travel for your thinking about how to do design in the museum. But how do you think of what you're doing here at the High and what museums are doing in general with design as being part of the future narrative? Uh, that's a great question, and I'm going to try to distill it. Um, so I am really interested in architects and designers that are interested in ideas, right? Um, and that's at its most fundamental. Um, if we peel back the onion a little bit, um, and I'm laying my cards out also, I am very interested in environmental activism, I'm very interested in social justice, I'm very interested in all the things that I think um, 
uh, uh, will make the world a better place. Um, and so if I, I feel like my job is to highlight um, those people that do the right things. And those are the kinds of architects and designers that I want to bring into the museum's collection. And those are the people that I want to work with and introduce to Atlanta's public. So that's a really, I, I wrapped that up very yes, quickly. Yes, yes. So thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Stephen, thank for you, sharing thank your you, um, brilliant thoughts. Um, and let's open it up to you guys. Um, if you have any questions for Stephen or Glenn um, in the last 10 minutes that we have here, the floor is yours. And I'll start calling on people. Because <laughs> I know half of you. Kevin. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank all the panelists, and, and, and yes, Monica is a fantastic curator, so we'll definitely give her uh, lots of rounds of applause for this great project, but thank you, Glenn, for coming tonight, and also, Stephen, thank you very much. I, Stephen, I have a, really a question for you, um, which is it's a two-layer question, um, or, or sort of, uh, you can have two answers uh, to it. Um, with the exhibition, with the catalog, with this project, what is... The one thing, even though we hope certainly our visitors come away with many things from their experiences, what is the one thing that you would hope that visitors would come away with in terms of their thoughts, their considerations, or perhaps even their questions as they leave the exhibition, as they put down the catalog? And the second layer to that is, <clears throat> if that visitor were a budding young designer, what would you want them to come away with? Um, my answer is the same for both, um, and it's pretty straightforward and obvious to me that you can participate in design. That regardless of who you are, regardless of what you're thinking, regardless of your interests, you can play a role in your relationship to objects. And I would say you have the potential in doing that to play a role in everyone else's relationship. Ideas are amongst us, right? <laughs> we all have ideas. We, we all have dreams. We all have ideas. We all um, can play a role in, uh, you know, this this bigger story of design. Um, so, please, same answer for both. Yeah, thank you. I'm making a shameless plug. Thank you all. Um, Berea College is coming here yeah. to the high in February um, to do workshops. So if you're a member, they're doing member exclusive workshops on Saturday the 11th and then the 12th, it'll be open to the public. So um, please come back. And you, some of the slides showed their great work. So it's gonna be, the students are doing the workshops. Um, so it'll be great. Aaron Beal will be here, the man that we've all referenced many times. <laughs> We gotta talk about your crush on Aaron. We gotta talk about, we gotta talk about that. He's eminently crush worthy, that's for sure. Everyone loves Aaron. So essentially, I kind of just have thoughts that relate to the conversation and I've been trying to figure out how to turn them into a question in order to be relevant. Um, I guess the best way to put it is, I guess towards the point of access and just understanding what design is for young people with ideas. And I think as far as our people and how visible, the ones that I think are the most visible typically have another entry point or another industry or from your perspective, another country that they come from. And I would just want to know, because I don't think I really understood that design was a real path until I think I was getting closer and then your exhibition kind of made things a little bit clear. Uh, but thank you so much. For someone in this position, what advice do you have as far as finding resources in the beginning stages? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you should all know that I grew up poor on the south side of Chicago. Um, I can tell you some stories about how tough life was. Uh, but my grandmother always made sure that we visited museums. Um, I had a membership to the Art Institute since I was maybe 12 years old. And I would go on my own from the south side to the north side, across that great dividing line of segregation, and um, just spend time amongst 
you know, creative things, um, paintings, photographs, sculpture. I didn't really know um, how it was affecting me, uh, but I always have been attracted to objects in space, to the three-dimensional world. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself now on a personal level. I love it. <laughs> um, I wanted to be a priest first. Uh, only because I was attracted to the objects and the object culture of the Catholic Church. Uh, it was the only place we could go in, in my neighborhood, in the hood, right, where, you know, we didn't find uh, a broken world, quote unquote, right? Um, and so points of access, I think, exist throughout society. We just have to kind of seek them out. Um, and, and be willing and open to digest them. Um, I went on to accessing sculpture through public television. Um, I saw uh, the Watts Towers and a documentary on the building of the Watts Towers, um, a, a whole kind of city built from, uh, you know, rub rubbish, you know, refuse. Uh, it was like, um, really eye-opening to me, right? To see all of these things sort of recycled into sculpture. Um, and then I found my way to design through architecture. Um, okay, not everyone has that kind of access as well, but uh, when I was in college, I worked in the library and, and you know, books and museums and all of the kind of accessible aspects of culture were always sought out and always presented to me. Um, I should also say that, that my mother um, worked three jobs. Um, my father did not participate in my upbringing. Um, but the one thing that she told me, uh, which always struck uh, home and stayed with, has stayed with me uh, throughout my entire life, is that I could be and do anything I wanted in this world. And it's important that we communicate that to our young people. Not only giving them the access, right, but giving them the motivation and encouragement um, to seek out uh, those things and, and to feel welcome and to create space to participate. Yeah, so well put. Thank you, Stephen. I think the only thing I would add to that is that then to not get in their way. Because I think the other thing that has uh, been happening recently is that there has been an expansion of access, but there's also maybe been, been an assumption that the shape of the status quo will remain the same. It's just that the population inside the gate will change. And it's, I, I think the idea that the shape of that space, the shape of the building, the edifice of design, um, will have to transform as it's um, in, in tune with its inclusion it is something that, from my point of view, institutions have yet to absorb. I mean, it's such an important question because I was thinking, you know, the very fact that we're in this room having this conversation means that we're the lucky ones who have been able to get that access in the first place. So that's obviously has to be the first step. That's why we did design and dialogue. Right? Absolutely, and it's 2022, yeah. you guys. I mean, it's, it's now or never. You know what I mean? There's no excuse. Yeah, that's really no excuse. Thank you for your question. Oh, we got one more. Uh, good evening. My name is James Williams III, and I, I came in a little bit later on, but one of the uh, big things that hit home that you all touched on was participation. Um, and as it relates to storyline and identity, um, I just wrapped up a residency and I uh, was able to uh, do some design products with the, the, um, the actual company. So when it comes to like opportunities to do shows and residencies like that, I am a self-taught individual. So I don't look at it as a barrier, it's definitely a point of exploration. But when it comes to uh, opportunities to do shows and residencies and things of that nature to get advocated, um, is there any advice that you would give to uh, a younger designer that is trying to uh, 
get get their chops or you know get a little bit of wind underneath their um, their wings or what have you. Yeah, we're getting some good. I mean, I don't know. I guess it seems very obvious from my very privileged position. Uh, so I hope that this is good advice. But I think you just have to make what you believe in, and believing in something is sometimes really hard, right? And making something is harder. So there, there has to be a commitment to your own work. Um, it took me quite a long time to recognize and, and realize and understand how important it is to commit oneself to the practice, um, to, to spend the time and, and uh, I guess, Investigate your ideas, interrogate your ideas, um, do the research, you know, understand your discipline, um, you know, educate yourself in as many ways as possible. Um, all of that helps you build your capacity for engagement, right? Uh, so it's, it's, I don't think that there's any kind of design or aesthetic or, or even um, path related uh, advice I could give because I believe everyone's path is different and when you recognize that you have a unique path and you have a unique voice then standing behind it I think is the work also can I just say you just kind of did the most important thing which is that you called for the mic and you said a little bit about yourself I mean you remember what Stephen said about 20 minutes ago he, when this, as soon as this book was printed he tucked it under his arm, and he and Malika went all around Europe, and he went to every curator and every museum director he could find and said, here's my new book. You need to know about what I'm doing. And this is Stephen. And he's been at this for 30-plus years, right? Well, and 20. What's up? You know. <laughs> We're not that old, but... Man, but you know, I'm still, I'm still knocking on doors. I'm still and uh, and that's the point, right? Because it it took how it took how long to be recognized, yeah. and the recognition is still not there. And yeah. so and so that's a great point, Glenn. Is you have to talk about yourself, otherwise no one else will. Yeah, I mean, talk about your work. Yes, yes, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to reveal all like I did. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Oh, Thank come on. You. One more <laughs> question. One more question. One more question. They're going to turn the lights off. And Who you got to make it to dinner. But is, there any, is there anyone else that has a last question? Burning, yes. burning question. Thank you. Thank you, Yadira. So you said that when you went, to, when you went out of the country is when you finally started to get some recognition, right? Can you, can you give the example maybe of the first time that the recognition happened? What did, what did you do in order for that to happen? And, I, and, and bear in mind that I know that some shit can't be taught. I get that. But, but, but I, think it's, I think if you could give an example for people who may need that, that would be excellent. Yeah, I mean, I... Um you know, I moved to New York, I went to grad school, I struggled um, to find gigs. I did everything from window display to set design to like, whatever jobs I could get. Um, but then I was offered a job um, in Milan. Uh, and I've always been very lucky with travel. I think it's some type of blessing, and I accept that. And, uh, and I make the most of it. And so I lived in Milan. Um, I saw my first Milan furniture fair. And that's when I made the decision to kind of pursue this world. And at the time, I mean, there were literally two American designers working in the way that I wanted to work in Europe. Um, and so, how did it happen? I um, pieced some money together, um, 
I made <laughs> some work which uh, wasn't the best, but you know, I made it. Um, a French gallery saw that work um, and commissioned me to make more work, and I had an exhibition at a French gallery, but all the while, and I'm telling a long version of the story, of course, but all the while, I was out there looking at design. I mean, I like the passion for design has always been there. And so I'm spending all my free time deeply invested in just trying to find spaces where I feel at home. And it could be, and this is a true story, walking down the street, I saw a doorknob on a door that I recognized. And I recognized it because I worked at the library, because I read all of these designs, because I, you know, studied design history. Um, and I recognized that doorknob, and then I saw the name on the window of the shop, and it was the same last name as the designer of the doorknob. And I went inside, and it was the sister of the designer of the doorknob. And so <laughs> then I told her my interest in the designer of the doorknob and my interest in design, and she called the designer of the doorknob. And then I was, the sister of the designer of the doorknob passed me the phone, and I was on the phone with the designer of the doorknob. So, so just like that, I went from being anonymous, walking down the street, to being on the phone with one of my kind of, you know, design, I hate to use the word heroes because I don't believe in design hero or heroes, period, I think, you know. So anyway, one of my design heroes. And, uh, and then I, he invited me to visit his studio in London. I saved up all my money. I went over there, hope, you know, with my portfolio, thinking I'd get a job. Um, he did not hire me. <laughs> but it was the first time I'd been in the presence of someone doing what I wanted to do at the level that I wanted to do it, that was internationally recognized, that was making things as simple as doorknobs and getting design geeks like me excited over doorknobs and, and, and expressing ideas through something as simple as a doorknob, right? You're familiar with Jasper Morrison's design of a doorknob that looked like a light bulb for FSB, which Champion move, right? Very conceptual, but still also very practical. Um, I, I'm telling you the long winded version of the story because what he said to me was, You will make it on your own one day. So it's that encouragement that gave me the strength to kind of swallow my pride and walk out the door feeling elated instead of de deflated, right? Um, he went on to become a friend. Um, we now text each other back and forth. But when I finally had that exhibition with the French gallery that saw my work, he came to that exhibition along with Giulio Capolini, who was um, and still is uh, one of the you know, most um, important trend scouts or talent scouts in design. Um, and he loved my work, bought my collection. The following year, I found myself showing him a lot. This was the beginning of my career. And so that simple act of knowing what I liked, knowing what my passion was and recognizing it and seeking it out took me all the way to London and then to Milan where I was there participating. So that's how it happens. Um, I'll just add, yeah. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> I'll just Thank add you. because I think Stephen is such a positive person, super optimistic, and it, and it feels like things just land in his lap, that that's not the case. No, and the story is a, is a really, is demonstrative of that. And also in our conversations, you know, we have talked kind of a, a lot about the, you know, the doors that kind of were closed through the years. And so I just say to you guys that like, um, you have to accept rejection sometimes, right? Yeah, but. <laughs> and? Walk yeah. through those yeah. doors that your predecessors have opened, yeah. right? I mean, there's a reason that we're in this room together. There's a reason I'm sitting on this stage having this conversation. 
um, with you all. And I, I believe, you know, um, like my grandfather told me, that we, we, we don't uh, seek out fame, we don't seek out fortune, we don't seek out friends. All of these things come as the result of doing our best work. And through doing our best work, the doors will eventually open, right? So. A lovely sentiment to end on. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you.